So we're, uh, we would like, what would we like to be able to do if H is the sum on rectangles of 2 to the negative n and a sub r are coefficients. And in particular, we're just going to restrict atten- So the, the coefficients are either minus 1 or plus 1. And then we, we defined uh, f of r1 r2, r3 to be the sum on r's such that the j side is given by the jth component of the vector a sub r, h sub r. So having, if you specify this information in each j, you then partition the unit cube and then on each unit on each of the corresponding dyadic rectangles you're considering, you either have plus one or minus one sitting here. The main reason, I mean, there's different reasons why three dimensions is harder. Uh, I, an important technical reason is the product rule doesn't hold. The product of two of these need not be of the same type. Namely, take the product of f sub r and f sub s and have them agree in one coordinate, but not the other two. So for that, so now we sort of define g, and let me just put n, to, since it depends on n, to be the sum of r. Uh, r with a little vector arrow is my notation for r1, r2, r3. not equal to s, r1 equals s1, and just, and the length of the vectors agree and is n, f, r, f, s. <clears throat> um, so this is the basic object that one has to be able to control uh, since, it's, since it's a witness, it itself is a witness to the fact the product rule doesn't hold. And uh, I'm, now I'm going to start using, grossly abusing notation, and I'm going to write such a sum as, and, um, and write equality in the first row. So one column would denote R, one column would denote S, and the little equal sign sort of reminds us that the first coordinate has equality. So how my little, <laughs> my little palette of colors seems to have changed. Maybe, it, will this still work? One. And then we did a little uh, reasoning um, How many free parameters are there in such a sum? You can choose one of n, n possible choices for the first row, two for the middle, three for the third, and then you're finished. Diagram is complete, so there's three free parameters. And then the, um, so then the basic theorem, and, and, and this is d equals three, is that this g sub n and LP is less than, well, behaves as expected. Now that we know this in dimension three, there seem to be problems with trying to prove it in dimension four and higher. Uh, the proof I'll give you, uh, there, it's, has, a, has a nice proof, which I, I wanna present. The proof I'll give you will give you five halves there because there's a symmetrization trick that will enter in that will, slightly inefficient, um, but gives a nice clean proof. I forgot to mention last time that such lemma or such theorem is in Beck's paper for P equals two 
and it's a nice challenge with that information to go find it. Uh, and, and, and Joseph Beck has the beautiful result, an argument, in which he, does, he gets this much smaller improvement over average case estimate, and he achieves it. Uh, and one of the reasons why it's only this very small improvement is that he uses L2 estimates everywhere. And, the, and these estimates actually are much more efficient in their LP versions. Okay, so if p equals 2, slight change in exponent on n, it's in Beck's paper. Okay, well, let's, so we want to use, so we, we're trying to bound, we want to bound this, a sum like this, where you have equality here, and this is over r and s and LP. And now, um, in, this, in the case of three dimensions, if R is, since R and S are not equal, but agree in the first coordinate, they must differ in the second and third. This is not true in four dimensions, and so that's why there's sort of four dimensions involves an induction on dimension. So let's just go ahead and agree that the order is like so. So this means in the second coordinate, the coordinate for R is larger than that for S, so the, so the FR function oscillates faster. That's where the orthogonality lies. And then the situation is reversed in, F, in S, in the third coordinate. This fact permits you to apply Littlewood-Paley in, uh, in the larger coordinates. Okay, so do so. Whoops, maybe I'll switch back to blue. Um, applying Littlewood-Paley twice gives me a single power of P. And then uh, I need to form a square function over R not equal to, uh, over A and B. A and B are the two maximal values in the second and third coordinate. So let me just, oops, now I go here, undo. Okay, I'm not doing something right. So this is A and B. And now you sum over pairs equal here, A here and bigger, and B here and bigger. You can see our abuse of notation is handy. Now it's very tempting to go ahead and simply square this out. And indeed, if you'd like the sharp exponent, gaining only one more power of p, one more half power of p, that's what you have to do. But, but, the, but um, what we can do is make this more symmetric. That is, make it so that there's no relationship between this val number and the value here and same for that. So the, so the new sum, so let me, is, um, A and B. equals a b but no other condition and the on, the only way i can do this is if i can take a conditional expectation and i still need my 
norm, okay. So you need to take a conditional expectation. That is, in the, first co in the second coordinate, you should average over an interval of length 2 to the negative a minus 1. And doing so will annihilate all cancellations that are faster than the a coordinate. You do the same thing for b. So now, so you've gained, so now your sum is more symmetric, but it, looks, but it looks like you've made things more complicated with the insertion of this conditional expectation. But it's, the conditional expectation is no worse than averaging, and it's well known that in the, this circumstance, you can make everything bigger by, make, by throwing away the conditional expectation. So you do so, and keeping track of powers of p, you get a p squared. And now you have sum a, b, sum, and this is a sum over r and, and s. a, b squared, one half to the p. Now you have a fully symmetric sum, and you simply square it out now. You square it out and collect terms, and, and you get p squared sum. And now I, I have four vectors, r, s, t, u, say. And, and the chart is now a four by three. And I should have equality here, which arises from this equality. Right? Because the situation is you have equality, but you don't know what the equality is. So if you take two paired, then they needn't be the same all the way across. You also have a pair of vectors that must agree in the second coordinate. So I place them there. And then you must have the, the opposite pair must agree in the fourth coordinate. So here you have equality. And we're taking pth powers. So it's, the, it's actually very helpful to think of this as a graph. And this is actually the note, part of the contribution of Beck's paper, was to introduce this graph theoretic language. In fact, it's hypergraph, but since equality is transitive, hypergraph is the right notion. But, but, but in this case, we just have, have a graph. And um, if I... The, I can make things even simpler, uh, possibly not losing very much, actually, if I fix this value and fix this value. They're prescribed. And I just use triangle and equality there. Then the remaining graph has two connected components. This, these two and these two. And so any pair of graph that contributes to one of the components also contributes. To the, so the, then the graph decouples. And the sum is a product of sums. So, to, so let me write down the first step in this argument. So you, you write this as less than or equal to p squared soup over values um, C1 and C2 of sum C1, C1, C2, C2 equals equals and a P norm outside.
And now, this is a product. A product of the sum over the middle pairs times the product of the sum times the sum over the outer pairs. So you've, you've disconnected the graph. So C1, C2. Oh, you know what? I have, I have been errant and not kept track of the fact that the square root, there's a square root sitting inside the LP norm. When you squared out the square function, it's more convenient to absorb the square root into the LP norm, which I forgot. And now this is, this is the sum over C1, C2 of equals to the P to the one over half, just using Holder's inequality, C1, C2, and equals in the third row to the P to the one half. Well, both ter ter terms are obviously the same. Um, Uh, C1 does not equal C2. That, that was not right of me to write. But down here, the vectors are, we can reduce to the case where the vectors are distinct. Therefore, you have, to, in the third coordinate, you must, one coordinate must be bigger. But that means, and uh, you get to use, notice the, how many free parameters are there. These two are fixed, so if I specify the equality here, the last row is fixed. There's only one free parameter. You get to use littlewood paley so you simply pick up another square root of p n, square root of p square root of n from either term. They both have the one half, so you're finished. So again, the, the free, there's one free choice of parameter here, but you have orthogonality forced on you in the last row. So you use the orthogonality there. And taking how many choices for C, so that gives me a P to the five halves. Um, each one of these gives me an N to the one half and they're inside square root, so an N to the one half total. And now I should just sum, um, I I should have written an n squared. I have an n squared number of ways of choosing c1 plus c2. So I have n. I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm messing this up and it's not even that hard. Let me redo that slide. I think, to, I think to this point, there is only one error, is the p over 2 and the 1 half. So now let me go to the next one and just delete it. And so you write is less than or equal to p in soup on C1, C2 of, su of sum C1, C1, C2, C2 equals, equals P over 2 to the 1 half. And why do I get, I have n squared choices for C1 and C2 but that lives inside a square root. So I just pick up the one power of n, pulling it using triangle inequality. What's that? P squared. P 
And now uh, you, you recognize this as p squared n soup c1, c2 of the sum c1, c2 equals times the sum c1, c2 and equals p over 2 to the 1 half. You use Holder's inequality on both. I mean, to, to separate these two, there's one free parameter right here, and orthogonality is forced in the last coordinate, so you finish the proof, and you get p squared You pick, pick up five halves, n to the three halves. The main point to our arguments are still ad hoc, and so the main point is to get some reasonable growth rate in p. Um, a larger value of p makes the arguments slightly less efficient, but you still prove theorems. So the, the five halves is actually more than good enough to go with. So we know three halves in dimension three. So in the, um, let's go to dimension two again. And, and, and then uh, H is the sum of A sub R, H sub R. And again, we stick to the case where all coefficients are plus or minus one, and this is the sum of fj, j equals one to n, where fj are the auxiliary functions where you have length two to the minus j for the r rectangles in the first coordinate. Okay, under the assumption that all coefficients are plus or minus one, the f, j are independent random variables. Of course, taking the value plus or minus one with equal probability. So the probability that the sum j equals 1 to n of fj, which is after all the term for which we're seeking the L infinity norm, the probability this is n is equal to the probability of the intersection of the fj's being 1. It's the only way you're going to reach n. And by independence, this is 2 to the negative n. Something that when I first, this argument first occurred to me, I thought, oh, we should be able to modify this argument to the case where only a quarter of the coefficients are zero. I still don't know how that argument works, or if it works. It may not work. But nevertheless, this is... Um, uh, What I can show you, and we'll do so in the last hour of the lectures, is how to modify, how to run an argument of this type in dimension three to get a partial result. So, I, so if I set capital, in, so in dimension three, you should set capital FJ to be the sum on R's such that the length of the first coordinate is two to the negative J, AR, HR. And then the probability that fj exceeds constant square root of n is bigger than a half for appropriate constant c. In this setting, the fj's actually satisfy a central limit theorem. Uh, and one can even deduce it from classical central limit theorem based on the independence property that I've already told you. But what I, what is, I can't estimate 
is the probability of the intersection of these events. And this is the question mark, 2 to the negative n. This seems to me that it must be so and would prove the small ball inequality in this special case. But I can't implement any argument to make it work. And, and indeed, what you will not have exact independence in this case as you do in the two-dimensional case. So the notion of independence has to be significant relaxed in some way. So instead, the, the, ar the argument that I'll sketch next time uh, with Billick, um, Parisis, myself, Aguiar, Shakyan, is again in this special case, so all the A sub R's are plus or minus one. H infinity is bigger than N One is the average case bound in dimension three, and we can get a quarter. I'm, or is it an eighth? I have to review this before tomorrow morning. <laughs> I think I better be safe and say an eighth. And in any case, an eighth is certainly the biggest number known. And The central tool to run this argument is the uh, Beck theorem that I've proved for you today. The, this analysis of the simple coincidence where you two vectors have an agree in one coordinate. Um, so I think this might be just the, the shortest lecture, but tomorrow morning will be long, a little longer. It's not a straightforward argument. Thank you.